All right, we're on. <laughs> I guess we're starting. We are starting. Nick, what were your thoughts of our first mobile on interview? We were on the, we were on the the on the flow. We were moving. We didn't know what was going to happen. We were whining and dining. We were we got whined and dined. <laughs> Quite an experience. Yeah. Um, but really good in conversation with Dean. Yes. Yeah, so office hours number four. Here we are. Here we are. For the thumbnail. Fantastic, fantastic conversation. He's super interesting. So, yeah, a little bit of personal background. I've known him for a little while now. Had no idea about any of his, like, personal history. And that was so cool to hear about. Yeah. Like, he has been so many different places he said that he moved or he went to like 16 different schools or something. Yeah. He went to a different school every year. The man has traveled very well. Like amazingly one man who's a high, high level soccer player and rugby player. He coaches. He's a got a doctorate from Cal. He is a professor at St. Mary's. He, certified diver. He's a certified diver who was diving in the Middle East for the oil industry. He's worked blue collar in Europe, you know, in his home country, working for the Royal Navy or where when his dad was in the Royal Navy. Mm -hmm. And moved to the United States to Illinois. <laughs> I believe, or it, it legit sounds like you're just saying a bunch of words because it's so diverse, yeah, right? Like, what? Where has this guy not been? What has he not done? Who ha and what has he not seen? Yeah, for real. Yeah, and now he still travels every Jan term for St. Mary's, right? Oh, it's wild, incredible. So it's really, what a life, yeah. And I think that's what's so valuable about this conversation too is that he just comes from this wealth of experience of real life stuff. Mm -hmm. Like I haven't been to three fourths of the places that he's been. And so yeah. he takes, he brings a, in a whole different perspective, mm -hmm. which is so cool. Yeah. Was there anything as we dive in that really stood out to you from the conversation that you've been thinking about? hundred percent. Robber's cave study hit me. It's yeah. Once he really broke down the robber's cave study, if you don't know what it is, you might have to go back and listen. We can link something in the description too, but if you don't know what it is, it's a fascinating study about like teams coming together. And then it talks about how there's a lot of competition if teams are forced to work against each other, working for smaller goals, but they are forced to come together if they want to work for a superordinate goal. And he just tied that back into our like political system and our climate today. And wow, that is exactly what is going on. Yeah, I mean, I think like the point you're making is that is a a study about cooperation, right? Like goal setting, cooperation, working cohesively as a group, you know, resolving conflict or in a sense because it's like they set up knowing that they would get conflict so you can reverse engineer that to not create conflict. Um and it's so widely applicable. Like that was youth sports was like what they used in that. Right. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I was reflecting on that study thinking like businesses could use this, right? Teams that are dysfunctional, mm -hmm. you know, setting goals that are appropriate for the team and, you know, bringing people together, allowing them to build camaraderie. Like there's a lot of stuff that can be pulled from that study. That's, that's really about human interaction more than it is um, sport interaction. Mm -hmm. And I think that was really cool the way he did tie it into other things like, you know, the political climate and, you know, social climate and all of that. I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. And so with that note, I wanted to ask you, I was thinking, and I mentioned this in the episode that I don't think we, like as a nation, we don't have like a defined superordinate goal. Mm-hmm. Or if we do, I don't know about it. So, like, what is it going to take 
to define or what should our superordinate goal be in order for us to start to somewhat come back together? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I think, you know, if I, I, I'm thinking about that from two different perspectives. Historically, I think, you know, as unfortunate as it may be, war has become the superordinate goal for the country that's really brought us closer in a lot of ways. I mean, you know, World War One and World War Two, there was, you know, incredible patriotism throughout the United States, companies joining together to produce goods to send to the war effort, people like wanting to volunteer because they couldn't let somebody else go to war and just be home doing nothing because there was like this feeling that you were doing something for the greater good. Mm -hmm. So that was some one thing I was thinking about on the other side of the spectrum, more 21st century. Um, the reflecting on the social dilemma, which I actually haven't seen, but I listened to the interview um, of one of the producers of the movie on the Joe Rogan podcast. Mm -hmm. And the way he was breaking down the, the way that the algorithms on these social medias work to feed the most polarizing of information. Um, we are so we're spoon fed the most extreme polarizing information at all times. It's how the algorithms of those platforms work because those are the things that get people engaged, whether they're accurate or not. So like the whole fake news thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think in a country where we are so um, quick to allow sparks of, you know, extreme perspectives really like, you know, we're giving them a much greater voice. The analogy used is those are sparks of extreme moments and social media allows somebody to pour lighter fluid on that and allow it to become a big fire mm -hmm. and burn and then become the perceived reality of the nation. And I think when we're doing that, all we're doing is creating a at scale us versus them scenario that is extremely dangerous and I think destructive of any potential superordinate goals that are out there. So I don't think war is the answer, obviously. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I thought that that's where it was going to cycle that was where through. I was going. Um, yeah, we just need to like, you know, go to war tomorrow. No. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to, we need to deal with that first. We need to deal with one of two things. If, there, if it's not going to change, as a society, we have to not allow these sparks or the things we see on social media to run our emotions the way that we've allowed it to as a society. Um, we've put all of our, we've become emotionally invested in these, in these services um, that are created to not get us emotionally invested. And then not care the means by which they keep us emotionally invested, which obviously has become in destructive ways. Um, so as a society, we either need to come to terms with the fact that that's not a reality that we can be living in. It's not healthy for our, our mental state of mind, or we need to somehow regulate how that information can be spread. And I don't know, you know, if that's necessarily the right answer either. Um, but I mean, if we can't handle that, we're going to have a really hard time coming together as a country towards some greater superordinate goal. Mm -hmm. So you're saying as long as this is in place, not regulated, like a superordinate goal can't be made on the side because we'll still be getting constantly divided by this. I mean, I'm just... I'm comparing it, you know, if we look at what's going on from 2016 to 2020, last four years, um, I think it's evidence that we will allow the things in our society that are playing out on social media to overtake any other narrative that is potentially positive. You know, I think 
there's probably more good than people realize going on in the space of like um, protecting the environment and global warming. Um, but, and that very well, very likely could be like a mission of the United States to like preserve, preserve more of the wildlands and, you know, looking at things like, like I, I mentioned on one of our other episodes, the air quality in certain places due to the, the lockdowns because people aren't driving has been noticeably different. Mm -hmm. So like we could take that kind of information and create some superordinate goal around just like bettering, you know, taking responsibility for the land in our control and putting our efforts there. But instead we're being fed all of the negative on a constant basis. And we prioritize there's a something called negativity bias mm -hmm. where like your your attention is more likely to trend towards the things that are negative rather than the things that are positive positive. Mm -hmm. and you so you as a result will prioritize those things in your mind as more important yeah and i think we are living proof that that happens so i don't think the implement like i don't think a superordinate goal that is a positive for the country can get through the current noise that is being presented to us by social media. Mm. Yeah, I think I agree. Because it's like social media has taken the stance of there is this side and there is this side. Like there are two sides to everything. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to pick which side you're going to be on. Yeah. Like I've been kind of just binging uh jubilee on youtube and mm -hmm. it's the common ground segment to where they bring in like flat earthers versus scientists and they have these people like discuss mm -hmm. super fascinating they do it yeah, on interesting ton of different topics it. check it out um but like that right there is just identifying also that there are just two sides and mm -hmm. that well i think it's hopeful because in the end of most of these discussions they come to I don't know. They reach like common ground, I guess, but there nobody changes their mind. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's the approach we need to take is that we're going to be understanding that people aren't going to change their mind, but they can still get along. Um, does that sound like so simple that it's like kind of ridiculously stupid? No. I mean, it does sound simple. I think it's one of those like easier said than done kind of a things. <laughs> it's like, I mean, like we know that social media is bad, but like I was on Instagram within an hour ago. Oh, yeah. You know what I, I mean? I know you're slaying it. <laughs> Just scrolling nonstop. <laughs> so like, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a conscious effort. Like you're saying to shift our, our perspective on stuff, but that's sometimes harder to do than, because these things are engineered this way, right? Mm -hmm. So, and maybe maybe that is it though that we need to develop a better relationship with disagreement. Maybe that's, I think that's part of the culture that's kind of developing is like my way is the right way, mm -hmm. and maybe that's always been a thing, and it's just becoming more present and relevant. But at the same time, like. I mean, you can argue that there is a right way. Mm -hmm. Like if you think politically, like there are morals and people have varying morals, but at the same time, I think we all have a, a general moral compass and yeah. um, like you, people are really in disagreement with certain people about different topics because it's like going against morality in a lot of sense, you know? Yeah. Like racism or a lot of topics around like abortion, things like this. Mm -hmm. um, and so how do you get along with one another when you disagree on something that is so true to your values and your morality? You're asking me? Yeah. Do, do you not? Do you just say like, screw everybody or? Um, no, I don't say screw everybody, but. I've seen it. He's, he's done <laughs> That's that. exactly what I did. <laughs> Um, I 
Man, right? Like, I like that's a big question. That's a, you know, because this is what's standing in the way of the superordinate goal. Other people feeling that their, you know, moral systems are being attacked. Yes, and challenged. In which they are. Yeah, for in sure. In my opinion, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I'll give you. And like a lot of the stuff that I say when we're doing like our moral dilemmas, like those are fun segments. Um, and I'll I'll give answers that are like a lot of times it's the what I wish the best Brendan would do in every situation. But like I'm and like I'm, you know, over exaggerating and being like trying to be kind of savage about it sometimes. But like like there's nobody perfect, right? But we're all just like working towards like a perfect example, like the, you know, like the moral dilemma we did of like cutting somebody off, right? It's like, of course I've done that, mm -hmm. you know, but my answer to you was don't do it. Yeah. So don't pay yourself like such a perfect person, Brendan. No, but my point is we're, we're all like, as I think the first and foremost thing that we all have to do is like all just really be honest with ourselves of are we doing our best? Um, in every scenario. And so I'll give you the, th the thing that I've been thinking a lot about right now, as far as, you know, with the highly volatile nature of the world right now with the election that we are in the middle of. Mm -hmm. um, Nevada is still moving so slow. Slower than molasses on a cold winter night. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. The, the thing that I'm to remind myself, and I think, you know, it's hard to do, but I think if we all can try and like keep this type of a mindset, it would help people feel less like their moral values are being attacked is that, you know, at the end of the day, like Nick's moral values have nothing to do with Brendan's moral values. You're allowed to have your own moral values. That isn't, that isn't, and and you should and it you shouldn't let me decide what your moral values are and i respect the fact that you're going to have different moral values than me and like with this election stuff you know regardless of which way anybody voted you know whenever this whole thing's figured out there will be a president and we will all have to deal with it so rather than feeling like president you know, X, Y, or Z is attacking my moral values or going against my moral values. I'm the holder of my moral values. Just because there's a president doing something that I dislike or doing something that I do like has nothing to do with what I'm going to do on a daily basis. We're all going to make the best out of the scenario we're presented with. We don't have a choice. What there if it does impact you on a daily basis. Give me an example of something that would impact me on a daily basis. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about people who are undocumented here. And if like Trump does press a really strong narrative of um, some type of racism and then also really enforces ICE, then that's something that I would really be concerned about each day. Like even more so, you know? Right. And... I guess my point is Trump is going to do Trump. Brendan is going to do Brendan. I'm not going to contribute to shutting the border down. You know, the country, the democracy will vote and we will live with the consequences of our vote, positive or negative. I, again, will continue to align with my moral values I'm not going to allow the negativity of a party or a belief system, you know, sway me to do something that I don't align with. But I also don't expect everybody to like do it my way. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who have grown up in certain ways or have perspectives that I do not understand and I will never understand. And I respect the fact that they're going to do things different doesn't mean I agree and I'm going to do it myself. I guess the moral of the story is I just 
don't think that people should allow their stress and mental well-being to be dictated by somebody else's actions. Mm -hmm. Like just because Trump does something, I cannot let that ruin my day. Otherwise, that would be a stressful life because every time you turn on the news or like we're talking about, Facebook will push something Mm -hmm. super negative right in your feed and you're going to have to deal with it. So are we going to let that tear our lives apart? I just don't think that's worth it. And I think we just have to be secure in our own belief system. And I think maybe to the point, um, you know, a good constructive piece that I can pull from this is that maybe people need to spend more time defining and, you know, coming to terms with what that personal belief and moral system is. Because I feel like maybe a lot of people don't have a well-defined moral compass. They are reactionary. And I feel like we could learn a lot about ourselves and be more secure in ourselves in these moments if we define what we are trying to accomplish morally every day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just, we just cannot allow other people to like have control over our emotions like that. It's brutal when it happens. And I'm not saying that I don't because there are things that come up and I'm like, damn, like what the hell is happening? Mm -hmm. But there's other times where I'm like trying to catch myself more and more often, especially in today's day and age, like, you know, I am not a contributor to that. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing something that's going to promote that. And that's unfortunate that's happened. And if I can do anything, you know, to do what I believe is morally correct, you know, I'll, I'll contribute what I can contribute. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, no, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. I just, I understand. I, I agree. It's like really taking care of your, yourself mm -hmm. in this and being able to separate yourself. Um, and I think like, we said it's like easy for us to say that when like if there was a system that was in place that was targeting like some of our identities then i think it's it's much harder for us to say like yeah we we should just really detach because those moments will be a lot more difficult like yes i still think it can apply but um when that peace is in power then it's like a lot harder for people to just say like, I'm not going to let this affect me when Mm -hmm. the power is directly impacting me. I guess I just, maybe this is the perspective I'm coming from with this. I just genuinely like, and this may be super naive of me and like shred me on, (laughs) on this as much as you want. I just genuinely don't believe that like the role of the president has that much power like i don't think there's that much power to the presidency as we give it like donald trump loves to spout off like on all kinds of stuff and presidents in the past have you know but there's a three-prong system here nobody just like goes and throws a wall up at the border without there being some kind of process put in place for that to actually become a reality and if enough people are making that happen then again, like we have to deal with that. We should all participate in our government in a way to make sure that our voice is heard. Mm -hmm. Um, And after the fact, you know, we can undo things that are done that we feel are unjust and we should continue to do that and audit ourselves as a country. But it's, in my opinion, I just like, I'm looking at this as like, I don't think that, the president, like I'm thinking the president sitting in the white house in Washington, DC. I'm just like, I just don't really know how he affects me. Like I'm going to just do whatever I can do in the situation that's in front of me, you know, like, but that's, I mean, I guess 
what yeah. your point is, then that is the problem because there are a lot of people who don't take that mm -hmm. and they are heavily influenced. And that's why we see this turnout of right now that like still half the country is voting for this man. Yeah. And are like completely behind mm -hmm. this rhetoric. And I guess that's the issue. Because like, what do you do about that? Because I mean, personal opinion, feel free to disagree, everybody. But he kind of came to power, like based on an idea of hate and divisiveness of like, starting to call people out saying that they're he's a troll yeah it's ridiculous he's an internet troll but yes and he was literally yeah. saying that like people are like rapists and they're drug dealers and and he gives everybody nicknames like these nasty nicknames he like starts naming people i'm like yeah he's in a position where somebody of his stature gives a nickname or puts a label on somebody in a certain way and there's weight to that mm -hmm. and he's and he's bastardized the position of being a president in a lot of ways. Yeah. And yeah. A lot of people have followed that and like push that narrative. And I think that's the problem. Like that's the danger is mm -hmm. that these people haven't separated themselves. But like that, the more I think about it too, it's like these people just align with that. And that's the scary thing. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people out there making yeah, I mean, people are presented with information and ideas and they some people latch on to ideas that other people say are bad. Mm -hmm. And that's extremely unfortunate. Like I mean, I'm I actually this to tie this right back in to our conversation with Dean, like Hitler was elected they mm -hmm. peep the state like the country of germany voted for him to be in power so i mean obviously i think a majority of people would say that was a mistake but something happened in there where everybody thought that enough people thought that was a good idea mm -hmm. so i think it's just that like it's the human condition is like we want to align with things that feel like they're going to get us to a place where we think things will be better. I think there's a lot of, I mean, to go back to our, uh, you know, conversation with Dr. Cloward, like, I think there's a lot of like under education going on out there, mm -hmm. you know, to then include this whole like social dilemma stuff I think people have a distorted reality of what is actually happening in, in the United States. Like, yeah, it's like people learned that two plus two is five. Right. Right. And if you're going to get your politics from the feed of the, of what is social media, you do not have an accurate perspective on politics. And I think this goes both ways. Like, I think there is an extremist hate for Trump that is maybe misinformed. I think there's, I mean, we know that there's things that are clipped. We know and, and are manipulated to create a certain message and agenda around him. We know it's being done. So like, how do we, how can we validate every single thing that's coming through our feed? That's like some, some Trump shame. Alternatively, he's done a ton of shit. That's been super messed up, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like and there's some absurd. undeniable stuff that he's done, but again, it's, it's the fire, it's the lighter fluid to a spark. Yeah. And who's going to see this? Yeah. Because only select people are going to see this side and then select people are going to see this side. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to lie too. When I found that out, that like social media does push the opposite of what you align with, I started to notice it right away in like Facebook videos, if you're scrolling through those, YouTube recommendations. I'm always listening to some like far right thing that I'm just like, God, these people, what are they doing? Yeah. I get, I get so many ads or like, because they're trying to, the thing that they've identified keeps you more engaged on their platform is stopping in disgust of the things that you dislike. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It's pushing me more towards my way. Yeah. 
you know? And it's, but it's also not you, the proverbial you. It's create it's creating an extremist out of you because yeah. you're so violently against the opposition. Yeah. You know, and um yeah, it's just it is su- it's like such a messy time with all of this. Like and I, I think I actually really agree with something like I something clicked in me that I just said that I actually really believe in i think the mass massive amount of like the population is heavily misinformed Mm -hmm. um because of social media and what gets shared and what you know and what facebook decides to put in your feed that day and what gets shared because it's been shared a thousand times and it's the most popular. Um, Well, and it's like, it's so good at showing so much, but it can never show everything, right? Like you can never consume, like we're consuming what, like an absurd amount of news compared to what we were 20 years ago, but we'll never be able to consume everything. And so there's always going to be a filter. So this is why we get computers planted in our brains and have all the information and we're all robots and we're fine. Exactly. And we get along. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jeez. But right? Like that that is a serious problem because like people are saying you see protests or riots or different types of things in certain areas and you don't see that that there's other areas that are pretty good or you see that areas are good but you don't see the poor you don't see the violence and it's like well how can you consume all this but at the same time if you're only gonna be able to see certain things then yeah you're gonna be manipulated Mm -hmm. it's a massive lack of context in a being presented in a way that is fact Mm -hmm. and it's like yeah you know what i mean like and that's why I think I've really become more of a fan of long de- long form interviews mm-hmm. because I just don't feel like there's a good way – like there's very few people who I feel like I can trust. Like I was joking around the other – like when it comes to media. Like I was joking around the other day about uh, – with, with one of my friends and I was saying every time I see like – Uh, like a news article or like a poll, like for the election going on right now or something, I always go and see, like my first reaction is who posted this and whose agenda are they pushing? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like I don't, I don't trust anybody's and like anybody's information. Like it's very hard to find trustworthy information. I'm skeptical about everything that I read on the internet. And like (laughs) probably, you know, in a lot of ways, to my benefit because I don't, I try not to believe a lot of this shit, but like, like states going for Biden or for Trump early. Yeah. I mean, and then literally people outside of a, like going to protest Fox news for calling Arizona for Biden too early. Did you hear about this? Going outside the county in Arizona? Like yeah, and they showed up a bunch stations. of Republicans, and they said they were like MSNBC was there filming, mm-hmm. and they were literally chanting "Screw Fox News," and the MSNBC guy was like, "Like sh- this must have been what was going through his head. Like this is great. I'm not even going to say anything. I'm just going to let these people <laughs> just shit on Fox News. Yeah. It's like <sighs> I, I like everybody. Everybody's got some kind of agenda, and that's why it's just so hard to like." navigate the dumpster fire that is the internet (laughs) (laughs) and we are just getting right on it i am armchair scholars business right (laughs) we are all about the internet (laughs) well hopefully hopefully (laughs) good news contributing a conversation that is long enough for people to actually gain perspective Mm -hmm. on some on a topic that they hadn't thought about before and you know what I, i realized about the long form conversation that I really like about it 
it's not necessarily that I like everything coming out of the guest's mouth. It's that, like, for example, Joe Rogan's interviews are crazy long, a lot of them. And I don't necessarily watch all of those interviews purely because I want to consume what that person has to say. But in a, if I'm sitting down and let's say it's like on a drive, I'm getting an hour there and I'm getting 20 minutes when I get home and then I'm stopping and then like during a workout, I get another 40 minutes or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's the process of listening and coming to my own conclusion about the topic that they're talking about. It's Mm -hmm. not about taking that person's word as truth, but I can, I can get a lot of information from somebody who's probably done some research in in most cases and I can analyze as they're presenting data met weigh my moral compass towards what they're saying figure out if it aligns with my ethics mm-hmm. reassess with the information I already know about a topic and I can come to my own conclusions and I can feel like it's a much more educated conclusion based on what's being presented and you don't get that in a 30 second clip about a riot in facebook dude any kind of interview on the news all right we're gonna have to cut it short there and move on to the weather and it's like wait presidential debates are an absolute travesty i don't get it at all and why don't we have real-time fact checking i mean yeah i don't know i made a linkedin post about this and i called it like on the fly fact checking on the fly as a mike pence reference i see what you did there yeah it'd be so funny (laughs) (laughs) But for real, it's a two minute blurb. Like if we just posted only two minute episodes of everything, it would not be representative of the perspective of our guest. No. Yeah. You'd know two minutes of them. You'd form a very probably extreme opinion or saying that they're either like boring or ridiculous or really smart and you would have no idea. Yeah. Like we could have clipped the two brightest minutes ever. And then maybe later they had just like a complete brain fart. And if we would have clipped that, then it would have been something so different. Yeah. Did you hear on a side note to take this kind of like in a similar line, but changing topics a little bit. Did you hear what Yelp? I don't know if this has been confirmed. So somebody, we can maybe fact check ourselves on this. Sus. It's pretty sus. Did you Yelp is attempting is my understanding to to include a feature that will allow you to identify if a restaurant or somebody at working at a restaurant is a racist what can do you know much about this feature like how does this feature show up on the phone I'll, I'll t- I don't know much, but I'll tell you what I hope it's not. I hope it's not some disgruntled person can willy nilly just tag somebody as a racist. Because I and I heard this funny line, not funny. I'm sorry. Jeez, uh, it was very intellectually tantalizing. <laughs> oh, there you go. Um, that the difference. There's only one letter difference between racist and rapist. And when you're talking about somebody, when you accuse somebody as a rapist, you have to have evidence. There's a legal process. And if you falsely accuse somebody, there's legal repercussions for that. When you tag somebody as a racist, you don't need anything. You can do it however and whenever you want. Mm. And you can absolutely destroy somebody's life for tagging somebody a racist. And if they're not, they will never lose the shame that comes with titling somebody like that. And that's scary. Like if somebody really wanted to, they could call Nick Bob a racist and they could completely good. And they could, they could destroy you. Mm -hmm. You would not be able to get hired because the word would get out. You could get kicked out of your programming school, you know, and there's nothing that, that can stop somebody. So, how Yelp, again, if this is true and this is actually something that they're going to go through with, how they're going to attempt to monitor this, 
I hope they know what they're doing. Yeah, I. That's dangerous grounds for Yelp to be entering. I'm just, I'm just really curious as to like, is this just a word that pops up under their description? Now, I believe like a, the way it would reflect on an account is there would be some kind of a badge wow. of sorts that would identify when you search a business if they've been accused or whatever it wow. may be. Where'd you hear this? Do you remember? Yeah, there's a podcast uh, by Rob Wolf who originally had a, a podcast called the Paleo Solution Podcast. And damn it, his new podcast, he just switched his podcast like a couple months ago. It's el- The name is eluding me. But if you search Rob Wolf, you'll find it. Two Fs in Wolf. Um, wow. And he, I mean, he's a, you know, a biochemist by trade and he's big in the nutrition and health space. Um, so, but he gets, he, he is not afraid to talk about all kinds of topics. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that's, yeah, I definitely need to do more research on this, but, um, being, you know, social, very socially charged conversation we're having right now. I think that that was a pretty present topic, but yeah. And do they have the right to do that? Are they allowed to do that? Is that where regulations step in and say, you can't do this? Like who, who's to tell like us to do if we wanted to do that against like our listeners no, we'd never do that obviously but yeah. i'm just saying like they're their own my understanding company. is that that word has no regulation against it it can be used as freely as people want right like yeah so can they do it like how sure and then they just experience like pushback obviously from people or i mean obviously they'll experience support as well but. Yeah, I mean, I'm curious how this is going to damage their, you know, one thing that I think happens socially around this type of, you know, it, this subject is that people start acting disingenuous and people start coming at it from the perspective of, well, if, if it's going to be that easy for me to be tagged as such, I'm not going to be involved. I'm curious, do more people pull out of Yelp not wanting to even like run the risk of being tagged? I mean, that could be detrimental to Yelp's oh yeah, like income and like revenue process because like they get a lot of um their money from being advertised advertised on. Mm. but like they're gonna possibly tank their ad revenue because nobody's going to want to be the top of the stack <laughs> or the the promoted yeah. business in a search query if you're going to potentially drive business there that's then going to accuse you of being racist on, with no regulation on it. I, yeah. I, side note again, I just had a funny idea pop in my head about like us promoting armchair scholars on Yelp. <laughs> and saying that like consume our content and people just see us at like the top number one of like everything they search and they're like where the hell is this place <laughs> how do we get there yeah but no yeah i okay rational brain says this will never happen right it's got to be like, it got to be something can't. that got like leaked yeah. from a yelp employee that's like never going to see the light of day i hope but at this only time. and let me be clear I only hope it never sees the light of day because I don't think it's going to achieve what they think it's going to achieve. If they could get it to really work Mm -hmm. the way it was intended, great. Do it, please. Yeah. I would love to support businesses that are more open-minded and welcoming to everybody. But it's risky. But how can we ensure that that's the way this is going to go? I just don't know that we can. And I think it becomes dangerous when – some disgruntled employee or, you know, a patron who did not get, you know, the service they were hoping just decides to weaponize that feature. Yeah. And I think that that's already in place. No, like people write reviews and say things like that. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. think you need to really put a badge on it. Like those reviews are up there. Right. So if you want to say something like that, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, okay. And maybe that's a good, a good way of doing it. If now granted there's a high level of 
ethical and moral um, responsibility that would be put on Yelp in the scenario I'm about to lay out. But if Yelp wanted to have an investigative team, maybe a legal team mm-hmm. on staff who was going to do in-depth research on reviews that were submitted that had the inkling of there being racist activity involved and doing an in-depth and then some kind of ranking system on the severity of the circumstances. And then as a result, Yelp had the right only to then turn over a rating on somebody. But again, then you're taking all the liability and putting it on yourself as a company. That would be super risky to do. There'd be no point. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah, I don't know how this plays out, but and that's like total power too, almost. Right. You know? I mean, it goes back to the same thing that everybody's, you know, getting on Twitter and Facebook about is like, how can you ban somebody from a platform that really should be, you know, the equivalent of freedom of speech? Um, and that's been a big problem with like, you know, accounts like Twitter, like shutting down, you know, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of things banned on social media and it's like well who gets who has the right to say what can and cannot be said like is that a freedom of speech infringement it might be yeah i don't know so that's a tough one that's mm-hmm. a yeah i i can't see that happening but god damn i also could not see donald trump becoming president so like honestly like if it happens i wouldn't be that surprised but very interesting topic you, did you hear that today? It was like two days ago. Jesus. Yeah. Maybe we'll bring that up in the moral dilemma. We'll do some, maybe we'll do some more research on the uh, what the actual like press release of what is actually going to be happening mm-hmm. is. And maybe let's see if we can uh, discuss that in a moral dilemma and we'll weigh it out. Bet. 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 Well, we got on quite the tangent. I don't even know how we got here. We straight up started with superordinate goal and then just got and to then just Yelp started racism. shitting on the United States from a place of love. I mean, yeah, right? Because we yeah. don't have a superordinate goal. Yeah. Like our goal is to have our side win the election. Right. And then what happens? Okay. So, yeah, let's game plan this real quick. Okay. Biden wins. Cool. Is there still this extreme divisiveness? Does it, I'm okay. I'm going to present you with an option. Does this divisiveness last for like a year? Like where people are really up in arms about what happened. Like Trump supporters are super pissed, aren't accepting. And then it like dies out and then things go back to normal, I guess. Or does this just like divisiveness just keep sparking up? I'll tell you what I realistically think happens if Trump loses. I think Trump does not have a good standing with any of the major media outlets. I think he's QAnon. I think he's primed to start his own media outlet, a network. That, wow. I think he, because like Fox, I mean, Fox was basically going against him. At the, at the coming down, like I think they're tired of him, right? Oh, for sure. Like it's like, exhausting. After, after like the first year, they were for sure starting to be tired of him a little bit. I think he's gonna. He has the ability to start his own media channel of some kind, whether this be a YouTube, whether this be whatever. Jesus, I think he uses that over the next four years to rerun in twenty twenty four, and we're not like it's not over. Yeah. There's no way like it's going to be a year of like the election was stolen from me. It's going to be three year two and three of the presidency would be. Oh man. Yeah. yeah, It's just would be shaming everything that's going on. And year four would be ramping up to be reelected in 24. Damn. Cause your two terms don't have to be consecutive. I do not. I'm like 90% sure. Wow. Right. I don't know. You said that really confidently. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> no, but yeah. I mean, I think he could realistically come at it from that angle. Oh my god! In which case, that's pretty scary. Especially like, 
you know, with everything going on, I think one of the major things that Biden's going to face, obviously, climbing out of the pandemic is going to be trying to stabilize the economy. And if he can't, Trump is going to have a field day with that. Mm. And that is what he is going to run on for 24. Mm -hmm. Um, Have you been thinking about this? I mean, I just like try and consume the media and formulate my own thoughts. No, I mean, that sounds, that sounds like it's going to happen. And I'm kind of, I'm trying to be well thought about this, but like it's, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I know, but I'm, I'm just thinking about it too. Like I could totally see how he could just use his, use his platform of this like really like obsessed following, Mm -hmm. you know, and just carry it. If he started a YouTube channel tomorrow, you know he'd have a few million followers within a week. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure he probably does. Like he probably does, does he have that. his own YouTube? Probably. I, I mean, but I'm saying it. like he's going to get out there and he's going to be the front man broadcasting daily. Jesus. He's going to have a team of people and he's just going to keep his political career alive. I mean, he's going to be the former president. He's forever in our history books. Like we're not – getting rid of Trump just because he wins or loses. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's not being talked about. I mean, maybe, maybe it is. Maybe people are thinking about that. I haven't been I'll own that. I, (laughs) it feels like if Biden does win or maybe just, yeah, like people trying to be so hopeful. People are definitely acting like everything is back to normal. We're like this amazing country again. If, Biden wins and it's like there's a lot of shit that still has to happen like one thing that I've been hearing a lot of and I really agree with is like there's been like the campaigning has it's been non-existent like normally during a presidential campaign there's like initiatives that like are being ran on by these two candidates like Sleepy Joe's been dead ass silent yeah we've actually only heard I feel like a couple things come up just around the election in general over like the past six months. Right. But like, I don't think any of the, either of the candidates have taken a stance on a major issue. Like if it was a traditional democratic campaign, well, COVID for sure. But that's been the, it's, it's such a present issue that that's the only one that they need to run on. That's what it seems like. From a from a a campaign planning perspective, you're right. From what the public actually needs, I'm like, oh, there's yeah. so many unanswered questions heading into any whoever wins on what they're going to do when they get into office. <laughs> yeah. Like, what is Joe's plan? What is Trump's plan? Like, I mean, Trump's going to continue to be Trump. We don't really need to speculate on his. Like, it's going to continue as yeah status quo, but. Like, I don't know what Biden's going to do. Like, minimum wages? Is that, mm. I mean, do we know anything? I mean, I haven't done my research. Education, healthcare. Yeah. Do we know anything? I don't know anything. And I'm not that well informed on this stuff. So I'm sure if we dug around out there, we could find something. But like, normally, like, they're blasting this stuff. And it's just been smear tactics this whole time. Yeah. And it's pretty funny. It's sad. It's sad. It is really sad. Which is why, like, I think it almost makes it easy for me to, like, disassociate with, like, Uh, what's going on. I see. It's just so – it's such a mockery of, like, what – I mean, what are we doing? I have no idea. <laughs> you know, like that's that's honestly how I feel. I'm like, so I'm kind of at the point where it's like, let's just go, let's let's hit 2021. I'm done with 2020. Yeah, you know. Hey man, let me just let's just all move Couple on. Months. We just all gotta take a step forward. I'm not gonna yell at anybody. I'm not gonna fight with anybody about anything. I'm gonna keep making podcasts, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> Having some conversation. This is probably our longest office hours. Oh yeah. It's been, been a good conversation. One. Yeah. 
think these are important topics to talk about. They are uh, very present and very prevalent. And wow, this race, it's pretty crazy just watching these votes on the TV, which is also another thing that I'm like, I see a number of electoral votes on one thing higher, oh, yeah. and then I see a lower. I'm like, apparently we're supposed to know a lot more by tomorrow, which will be Yeah, Friday. apparently Nevada like said they weren't going to announce any more ballot counts on, for like 24 hours. Yeah. Is what I heard. So like we're not going to know anything until to- anything more until tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And but yeah, like 84% of the ballots were had been counted and they already had given it to Joe Biden for Arizona. Mm-hmm. Like yeah, I mean, mean it like fought back and then it's it's getting it closer like, now. Like that's the thing. It wasn't decided yet. There it was not decided. So we just there's nothing we can do but wait. And both both sides have made claims that it looks like it's like it looks like we're gonna win. Oh, that was like on confident night. Yeah, yeah. Both like, both sides. It's like what? It's like all right. Yeah. <laughs> hey, give me some of that confidence. <laughs> yeah. And this thing, whole thing's gonna blow up, right? Like Trump's already suing states for like fraud you know, ballot misconduct or whatever the allegations are for states he's lost in. And that's one of the things that bothers me the most too. It's like, we have this person who is supposed to be like just a leader, you know, and they're complaining and like trying to change rules. I don't know. I mean, obviously I don't know the details about what's going on with the voting. Like I'm just a person who voted. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, it, the way it comes off is just so childish, like lower than childish. Yeah. So, oh, Jesus, what what the hell is going to happen? Nick, I think you need to run for president when you're of age. Bob 2020. Bob 2020. Dude, people would for sure get behind Bob 2020. No, what what year would you be able to run? Um, give 30. me like 20 years, right? No, 35. Wait, I'm not going to run at 35. I'm still trying to no, live what, my life. no. <laughs> So what would that? You're twenty twenty five now. Yeah, is twenty thirty an election year, or would it be thirty two? Dude, it'd be. Oh my god, I don't bobbing in twenty thirty. Jesus, Jesus. (laughs) Write my name in. (laughs) No, I'm never. I'm never doing that job ever. Yeah, sounds terrible. It sounds awful. Yeah, it sounds like the no. The highest thing I'll do is like maybe a student council. <laughs> Last president. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. Okay. Well, thanks for tuning in. This has been quite an episode. Uh, we were we we're going to have a new episode dropping next week. We talked to a professor who talks more about sport and student athletes transitioning out of sport. Really fascinating conversation. Um, Brennan, do you want to? And this one out. I think you close that out beautifully. Okay. Well, bye everyone.